everyone clear that this being recorded. Uh, and I think Kim went over the, the basics of Zoom already, so I don't need to, to go through that. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on the, the hands raised feature. I'm going to mute everyone right now. It looks like most people muted. Great. Let me just get this set up. All right, so I just want to start with a few disclosures. Like Brian mentioned, uh, I've done uh, a lot of work with photodynamic therapy and trank off imaging. And within photodynamic therapy, uh, myself, Brian, and Alberto Ruiz are starting a commercial venture together. Uh, and we've submitted some patents on uh, some of the technology I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, and then with Trankoff Imaging, I'm currently uh, recently started consulting for Dose Optics. And uh, what I'm presenting today has really nothing to do with what I'm consulting on, but I just wanted to make that clear. And uh, Dose Optics has provided some hardware and customized software for some of the work I'm presenting today. So today I'm going to be talking about some uh, modeling work that I've developed to help uh, look at applications of in vivo uh, uh, treatment and cancer diagnostics. Uh, so sort of uh, to start out, I want to start with just the inspiration or some inspirations from science fiction, because it's always a fun place to start with uh, these different projects. And uh, thinking of the idea of from Star Trek, there's this uh, device called a medical tricorder from the 24th century. And uh, I was wondering how, how this works and how this um, might be related to some of the things we're talking about today. And this is Ideally, it's a, it's a handheld device that's used in um, the medical field, and it provides a lot of uh, information to doctors to make quick diagnostics and have quick feedback in the clinic. And this is really sort of the, the holy grail of what we're, we're trying to do uh, down the road. And so, of, of course, I have a copy of the Star Trek technical manual uh, here at home, and I looked up the specifications for the medical tricorder the other day. And it's based on uh, a lot of electromagnetic uh, signals, and it uh, provides uh, this feedback to doctors very quickly. And one of the interesting things here is that uh, it says in the specifications it can do, uh, it can perform about 15 billion calculations per second, which if you look at a, a modern iPhone is actually slower than the, the current iPhone. So we might be close to getting there. And so uh, the tricorder it uses electromagnetic uh, spectrum uh, to, to scan the body. And so what wavelengths would be useful here? Uh, we can see here that this is a plot of electromagnetic waves and how they interact with water, which is equivalent to tissue. And so as you move towards the right on the x-axis, uh, the wavelengths get longer, the lower energy. Uh, uh, so it goes from gamma rays and x-rays uh, through visible light and into the optical light, infrared, and then in microwave, into microwave. And so these are used commonly in medical fields for nuclear medicine, uh, x-ray, optical um, and near-infrared uh, imaging, and then uh, MRI or, or radio frequency imaging. And so there are three distinct windows here, windows of transparency. And I'm going to be focusing on two of them here in nuclear medicine, where these are areas where there is um, very low attenuation for water or tissue. Uh, and then also in the optical realm, there's um, a window here that allows us to see deeper into tissue. And so the background and some motivation here, uh, before we get started, just a high level overview. Uh, so optical diagnostics and radiation therapy are two really large sectors in the medical fields. And we want to use these to improve diagnostic feedback uh, for cancer treatments and uh, therapies. And so some of the applications I'm going to be talking about are photodynamic therapy. So this is using light to activate drugs and estimating the dose, the effective dose that you have. And then in radiation therapy, uh, using uh, different techniques to estimate the amount of oxygen in tumors during, during treatment. And so the overall goal for all of this is to, to translate models, uh, computational models, into something that can be used clinically uh, to reduce complexity and uh, improve, in, improve on reproducibility uh, between uh, different applications. And so there are four major aims here. Uh, the first uh, two are focused around photodynamic therapy, the first being uh, developing models for photodynamic therapy uh, and using this to, to model the amount of light that's available in tissue uh, for, for treating uh, disease, uh, so both narrow band and broad spectrum light. And then the second aim expands on these models to actually use weather reports as a surrogate for uh, radiance measurements. 
uh, and uh, seeing if that, this can be used uh, for planning uh, daylight therapy treatments. And then in the field of uh, radiation therapy, uh, the uh, models were, were expanded to, to look at high energy physics and how that can be used to estimate a terrain cuff light, which I'll be talking about, and how the terrain cuff light can be used to excite other compounds to provide contrast uh, using specialized detection hardware. And then the fourth is experimentally applying uh, these, these models uh, to look at how we can uh, estimate the amount of oxygen in a tumor during radiation therapy. So there are nine chapters in total in my thesis. Uh, the first is just an introduction to photon interactions with matter. And then uh, I, I talk about how Monte Carlo modeling can be used uh, and developed in a more efficient manner than uh, what was currently available. And then use these models for photodynamic therapy, uh, dose planning, and the weather-based dose planning for daylight uh, activation. And then uh, look at uh, kind of switching gears. I then apply these models to, to look at uh, Trenkoff imaging and how that, that's used in for in vivo signal analysis. And uh, then uh, look a little bit deeper um, using some more um, complex models of uh, the Trenkoff spread in tissue and the limits of detection for Trenkoff excited luminescence. And then uh, there's a chapter on just different compounds that can be used as contrast agents during radiation therapy. And then uh, finally, uh, the last experimental chapter looks at how to apply these and, and come up with almost a near real-time uh, non-contact sensor for, for tumor oxygen um, during uh, external beam radiation therapy. And then finally, conclusions and summary of work. So to get started, I want to talk about uh, just the basics of Monte Carlo, just we're all on the same page. Uh, so the idea is that you have a, um, in this case, a photon, so this packet of energy that's uh, considered an event, and it moves a certain step length uh, throughout the simulation. And so those, after each step, uh, the computer essentially uh, randomly decides what it's going to be doing next, whether that's a scattering in a new direction or uh, absorbing in the tissue. And if you do these, these uh, approximations and estimates uh, enough, you can actually have a statistical um, estimate of, of what events are most likely uh, to happen. And these events and uh, when the computer decides uh, which event happens are all based on properties of the tissue that you can provide to the model. And so for wavelengths, a blue wavelength that uh, 400 nanometers might have uh, pr certain properties that are refractive index, the anisotropy, uh, the scattering and reduced scattering coefficient or the absorption coefficient. And so here, uh, the value, the anisotropy G says how forward directed the scattering is gonna be uh, for the photon and is combined with the scattering to estimate how many scattering events are going to happen per millimeter. Uh, and then same with absorption, the mu A, uh, how many of absorption events happen per millimeter. And so the Monte Carlo uh, model has an engine that uh, can, I'm just gonna admit, uh, someone in the waiting room. Um, so this Monte Carlo uh, model has an engine that basically runs the prob probabilities of these different events and decides what to do at each event. And then if you run these for millions and billions of events, you can actually estimate with um, relatively high certainty of what would happen in different geometries. And so, oops. One of the, the packages that we use in our, in our group is, uh, it's called Gamos, and it's actually built on a, a platform, a physics platform um, that's generally used in high, uh, by most uh, physicists that, that look at high energy physics. And so Jant4 is this platform, and it's uh, developed in C++, and you actually have to write C++ code to, uh, to uh, run the simulations. And the code is used to um, define the, the particle that's the input uh, event, so it, whether it's a photon or electron or, or other um, particle, you define the geometry of the world and then the detection parameters. And so it's, it's relatively complicated to get this installed and get it working and, and write C++ code. Um, there's kind of a really high and steep learning curve for it. And so Gamos is a tool that we use uh, that um, has been developed by researchers in Spain, and it wraps uh, Game of, or it wraps Jant4 uh, in a package that allows uh, easy plugins to be created, and then all you need to write are two text file inputs, and then uh, you don't need to write any code to run the simulations. 
And so in 2013, Adam Glazier and our group uh, wrote a plugin, uh, which was the Dartmouth Tissue Optics plugin. And what this did was expand the, uh, the capabilities of Gamos to be well beyond uh, what um, the, the high energy physics world is using and also use this low energy uh, physics uh, for optical uh, photons, Trankoff uh, generation, fluorescence, and scintillation. And so this was created in 2013. And uh, some of the work I've been doing is updating uh, his, his plugin to work with the latest version of Gamos. And if we just uh, take a, a minute here to look at uh, the installation size of, of these packages. Um, so this is the, the amount of space it takes uh, to install. It's actually seven to 10 gigabytes to install uh, um, this instance, which um, will be important in a moment. But one of the, the big pieces of it is root, uh, which is a, uh, a physics package uh, for uh, visualization. It's just for visualizing the output. And it doesn't really have anything to do with the, the simulations, but it, it takes a large portion of, of the um, installation space. And so uh, you can install Gamos on your laptop or on a server. And commonly uh, what people do is they try to, they'll buy a big server or have a high performance computing cluster and install this and then basically assign different cores of the, that server to, to run Gamos. And this can be relatively complicated. The installation process isn't um, very easy and uh, isn't easily reproducible. And so one method uh, to get around this is to put uh, Gamos, uh, the whole installation, into a, a virtual machine, which is basically an operating system running virtually on, on top of your operating system. So for example, uh, you would uh, have an operating system like Linux or Ubuntu install Gamos in it, and then you could run that on your Mac or your PC and not have to worry about um, uh, if you have the right libraries because they would all be packaged in that virtual machine. Now this works uh, to help uh, get basic simulations working, but it doesn't, um, it's not very efficient. And so a more efficient way of doing this is using the idea of containers, which is used in software development a lot um, in more recent years. And this, you only install the, the application once and then they're they're basically compartmentalized areas that can access uh, and have their own sort of memory space for accessing the, the um, program. Um, but to go one step further, what I did was uh, use these containers and, uh, and deploy them in the cloud. And so then you have almost unlimited resources and, and um, computing resources to run simulations. And so this is uh, just a rough schematic of um, in Amazon Web Services, you can define how many servers you want, which are the, the compute, the EC2 compute um, services. So this is our basically servers that you just write a script and say, I want two or 10 servers. And then within that, you can install these containers that are, have Gamos pre-installed on them. So each server can run anywhere from two to 16 to 30 uh, containers, depending on the size of the server uh, within it. And all of this can be, I've written scripts that scripts um, to automate the deployment of all of this to help make it more reproducible. And then when each of these containers are done with their processing, they can output to um, a storage bucket or essentially a shared workspace um, or folder space where you can download the, the, and control who has access to the results. And so just an example of running this, uh, this was running um, for a bunch of different wavelengths of light. Uh, we wanted to run the same simulation, but just change some of the inputs. Uh, so this was using four servers on Amazon Web Services uh, that actually had 56 different containers on it. And so if we were to run all these simulations sequentially, it would take about two days. Um, but uh, using this, this parallel execution where they all ran simultaneously, it was under two hours to run it. And, one of the nice things about this is you don't have to worry about the upfront cost of buying a high performing uh, server. You can just uh, run, run these simulations and then when you're done, turn off the servers and you don't get built uh, for anything after that. And so uh, I wanna talk about how I've used this in photodynamic therapy. And so just to give some background on what photodynamic therapy is. Uh, so phototherapy uh, has been used for hundreds of years. Actually, um, it, there are reports of it even being used back in ancient Egypt. Um, but the, the third Nobel Prize in medicine was given to Niels Ryberg uh, Finsen uh, for actually using light radiation to treat uh, tuberculosis of the skin, this lupus vulgaris. Um, and so um, this is just a picture I found on the internet of what that looks like. So nurses with their, um, their uh, eye protection and very concentrated light uh, being directed at the skin. 
and so before and after uh, it had really um, it, it's obviously worked really well uh, and the, these are kind of uh, things that we, we continue to do um, with different light sources today and different uh, activated drugs and so the drugs that you can use to activate to make it more um, the skin or other areas more sensitive to light are um, photosensitizers. Uh, they're commonly porphyrins. And this is a, um, just a, a picture of a doctor back in 1913 that decided he wanted to try a hematoporphyrin on himself. And so um, before and after, he had a lot of inflammation. And uh, there are some issues here where the, the drug doesn't clear and isn't very um, selective. And so modern uh, drugs are a lot more selective and clear much faster. And so the FDA approved drug for, for treating uh, actinic keratosis is called ALA or amino levulinic acid. And this is uh, taken up by mitochondria uh, in, in the skin. So it diffuses down through the skin. Um, and then the mitochondria in the cells produce PP9, which is the photosensitizer. And uh, so uh, the light can be activated. Um, can be used to activate this uh, photosensitizer. And um, the, the drugs that are available of the ALA formulations, they're different manufacturers. There's um, Dusa makes Levulin in Europe. They use um, Metfix, which is a cream-based uh, version of this. And then um, Amaluz is a nano emulsion version. And so clinically, this is what some of the lights look like. And uh, you can see these blue and red lines are from simulations I did of light uh, entering a seven layer tissue model that has PP9 in the first millimeter of the skin. And the absorption spectrum of PP9 is over here where it shows that uh, the blue light, it, it absorbs a lot of blue light. And then there are these uh, little bumps here, which are Q bands, and you can also excite those. So the red light is used to excite one of the Q bands and then um, blue light is used to excite the sorite band over here. Uh, so there are differences in the penetration depth of these lights. Um, so the idea that you, if you shine a light through your hand, you see more red light come out the other side is because uh, red light can travel uh, further through, through tissue. And so if you see here, the blue light only really penetrates about 200 microns, whereas the red light's going much deeper, um, but has less fluorescence. The yellow lines that come out of, of these uh, simulations are the fluorescent photons, which when PP9 is activated, it creates a cytotoxic environment that uh, kills local cells, but it also fluoresces uh, in the uh, near infrared. And so uh, more recently in the past five or 10 years, uh, probably the last five years or so, uh, there's been a lot of push, especially in Europe for daylight activated PDT. And so this is a picture of two dermatologists from uh, Denmark that are treating their patients in this gazebo that they put together in the courtyard of the hospital. And so this is used uh, because uh, some patients uh, report with the blue and red light, uh, the very short but intense uh, radi radiation from the light causes pain. And uh, research has found that with daylight PDT, the pain is, is greatly reduced and much more to tolerable. So patients will go outside and sit for about two hours and get their treatment. So one of the issues here though, is that you're using broad spectrum light. So it's hard to control uh, what the light dose is that you're receiving. So this is uh, the, the spectrum of sunlight that we measured inside the lab. So it's filtered by uh, the window and then the spectrum of the PP9 absorption. And so what uh, clinicians do and, and um, physicists that are, are doing the dose planning, medical physicists that are doing dose planning, they'll multiply these two wavelengths together to get an effective uh, irradiance. So if you multiply these two waveforms together, you get something that looks, looks like this and gives you an effective um, irradiance value of what you're using to treat. And this is what people have been using to compare different doses uh, uh, for if you have a artificial light source like a light bulb versus the sun, you can, you can weight both of them and come up with um, an, a similar um, dose, light dose. And so some work that I did with Kalamara uh, a few years ago where we actually wanted to make an equivalent dose. So we retreated mice. Uh, you can see here they're, they're mice uh, under blue light where we have some plexiglass to block off any uh, harmful UV. We have them under a grow light that we got from a local store in, in White River Junction. Um, and then we actually brought the mice uh, up to the roof of the Williamson Research Building and put the plexiglass here to block the, the UV light and then treated them um, all with the same uh, effective uh, weighted PP9 or weighted uh, irradiance. And so we found when we did this, we actually saw similar cell killing between all of the, the group, the three groups. 
And so moving on from there, I wanted to look at simulations of uh, how we can actually do dose planning better to account for the, the spectrum of the light. And so all the simulations and this work that I'm going to be talking about is available in this paper and also uh, the, the code is available through an interactive um, uh, service provided by Code Ocean, where you can actually upload the, the whole notebook and uh, people can, can run it on their own, change the inputs and try, try different uh, things with, with the data. So if we look at the seven layer skin model that um, I briefly mentioned earlier, so uh, each layer has different optical properties based on uh, what the layer is made out of. And it's, it's color coded here where um, these arrows indicate uh, uh, the, the same color on the, this map of uh, the fluence rate uh, based on spectrum and depth into the tissue. So as you get deeper into the tissue, much of the blue light is, is attenuated where the red light uh, at the longer wavelengths can penetrate much deeper. Um, but the blue light is what is used for, for PP9, um, the peak PP9 absorption. So if we use the idea of PP9 weighting and we multiply by the spectrum of PP9, we can come up with a, a weighting value that shows that actually a lot of the, the red light is really just as important, if not more important than um, uh, for activating PP9 than the, the blue light. And so uh, I did a, a literature search to find what uh, thresholds of uh, the minimum light dose you would need to activate PP9 and came up with this uh, effective uh, threshold here, uh, this, ver uh, this horizontal line uh, that's on this graph. And if you uh, essentially sum or integrate over um, a certain uh, treatment time, you can show that over as the, the time increases, you're having uh, more and more light. Um, and higher fluence, total fluence, uh, penetrating the skin at different depths. And so where the different light sources, so there's the blue and the red and the different uh, broad spectrum light sources cross this threshold is basically the, the maximum depth you can have effective uh, cell killing. But uh, this doesn't actually account for a few things that are uh, fairly important. Uh, some of them being the, the, how quickly the drug, the ALA penetrates the skin and uh, how far it can go into the tissue how fast the PP9 is produced uh, once the ALA is, is in that um, area of the skin. And then uh, as you activate the drug, you actually degrade it. So you photo bleach, especially at the top layers, um, the, the drug, the photosensitizer. And so um, if we look at for the same uh, incubation time and we account for all these factors, you can kind of, you can come up with uh, these graphs that show the uh, amount of um, photodynamic dose. So that's the concentration of the drug multiplied by the total fluence uh, for different treatment times. And so where, where are these, sorry to go back and forth, uh, where these uh, lights uh, cross the, the threshold is basically the, the, um, the depth at which you can achieve effective treatment. And so using these models, uh, so clinicians, dermatologists have way too much to worry about to have to think about calculating these, these, these doses. And so what we wanted to do was come up with a lookup table to make it a lot easier where they can just say, well, it's a sunny day in the summer. Um, this is what the estimated the sunlight is uh, for irradiance values. And um, I'm going to incubate, so basically apply ALA and then let it sit uh, occluded for maybe five minutes or 30 minutes. How long do I need to treat the patient if I think their, their lesion is, is 500 microns thick? And so using um, these lookup tables, uh, we, we, we generated um, different values of the minimum treatment time that you need to achieve um, what the model indicates is an effective cell killing uh, at these different depths. And so the yellow and the red indicate um, basically times that are, the yellow are over two hours, but um, under two and a half hours. And then if you're beyond two and a half hours, it's kind of the maximum that's used clinically. Um, it just basically says you shouldn't uh, treat uh, something that's that thick. But commonly, it's generally not that thick for treating actinic keratosis. But if we want to move this in the future to see if we could treat other thicker lesions, uh, this might be something that would be useful. And so uh, moving forward with the models, we wanted to test this clinically. And so we're working on, on developing some clinical um, collaborations here. Um, sorry. Um, and so this is the dermatology clinic at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Uh, and this uh, window here is the Mohs waiting room. And so uh, some patients often go in for dermatology for Mohs surgery. They'll, they'll sit in this waiting room. And um, 
and uh, it's fairly sunny for, for good parts of the day. And if we look at a satellite view of, of the same facility, um, we can see that that, um, that waiting area is right here uh, in the building. And then the sun in the morning uh, actually is blocked by the building and it's more of a Southwest facing building. So these are things that you need to think about when you're doing daylight PDT, especially if you're doing it indoors, that there are going to be a lot of obstacles that um, need to be accounted for when you're planning for when you can see tr um, treat patients. And so if we, we took a few measurements uh, in front of the building and in the waiting room, and then also there's a little picnic area across the parking lot um, to do a site assessment to see when it might be possible to do uh, PDT treatments. And so if we look um, just in front of the clinic, there's uh, a, a tool that's commonly used in the photovoltaic industry uh, to, you can do a one-time assessment and estimate the, the uh, potential available sunlight for all the months of the year at different times of the day. And so uh, much of the afternoon is, is pretty sunny there, especially in the summer. Uh, indoors, it, it should be about the same, but there's actually an overhang on the, the building that protects um, during peak sunlight hours uh, for energy efficiency in the summer, it, it protects that area. So it's actually a little bit shaded, uh, which um, wasn't completely obvious at the, when we first started this, but um, around noontime, it, it's, it's shaded in that same area. Whereas the picnic area across the parking lot away from the building, is uh, sunny for, for much of the morning into the early afternoon, especially in the summer. And so these are things that we're proposing could be done as a, a way of doing a quick site assessment along with uh, measurements of the irradiance and uh, spectral irradiance. And so other variability in daylight uh, treatment is um, weather. Uh, so uh, here, this is just measurement of the, the total irradiance uh, measured at the second floor clinic, uh, the waiting area. And so the, the first day is a little bit, it's partly cloudy. And then the next day, um, the blue uh, shaded area is in the morning and the red is in the afternoon. We can see that because the building is, is um, blocking the sunlight, there's some diffuse uh, light, but really not a lot until after the sun crosses a certain threshold and then it gets very bright in the clinic. And then the next day after this is a little bit cloudy, um, just partly cloudy. And then this final day, it's, it was raining overcast all day. So there's a lot less sunlight available. And so we can actually measure the spectrum of the light. That's how we generated this graph. So the spectrum, um, there's a lot going on here, but it's basically the spectrum at, at every five minutes over multiple days. And what I did with all of this was to integrate the, the irradiance and come up with the, the irradiance value, which is the top value, and then the PP9 weighted irradiance that are effective um, irradiance value. And then I correlated this with uh, weather reports from the local airport um, that are publicly available. Um, just you can download whole tables of them. And um, we can look at the, the forecast. So if it's clear skies, cloudy, um, partly cloudy, um, the percent of clouds in the sky, the UV index, and the amount of sunlight um, estimated that should, should be there. And so when we look at just the ideal sunlight, so what should be there if we're not accounting for clouds, there actually is a pretty poor correlation. So on the x-axis is the PP9 weighted irradiance that we would calculate from, from measuring this, the spectrum compared to the, the weather reports. But when we account for clouds, uh, there's actually a very um, strong correlation uh, between the two. And the same is true for the UV index. And so um, we're using this as part of our, um, some of our ongoing work. And so this was actually uh, tested by a group in um, a photobiology unit in, in Scotland. They, they do daylight PDT uh, clinically and um, they used our model to test out to see if it actually would, would work. And they, they found it, it correlated fairly well, um, even though we were across the Atlantic from each other. And so this is what we're um, with Alberto and Brian, we're, we're working on developing a, a company to um, make this into a product where the idea would be you have a cell phone app and you can do a one-time site assessment to estimate how much light is um, available different times of the year. And then also what the, the spectral changes are based on if you have windows or other factors um, at that location. And then that would register the site in a, in a database um, on the internet um, that would be accessible by this app. And then uh, when you want to use the app, you would get the current weather conditions by just having your local um, having your position known by, by the GPS that's on the phone already. And then um, using the device that Alberto uh, Ruiz has been developing, we can actually measure the amount of um, PP9 through fluorescence imaging with a clip-on device that would go with the phone. 
and then combine that with uh, the weather forecast, the dose models that we've been, we've been um, developing, and then um, some information about the site and come up with information for the clinician to say, if you incubate for 30 minutes, um, your minimum treatment time is X amount of time. And then keep track of all the measurements that they take with the device all together. So that's sort of the idea for the future, um, where we want to go with this. And um, now I'm going to take a break from PDT just and switch over to uh, shrink off imaging. So, um, at first, this, this might seem like a completely different thing, a uh, different uh, idea, and, and uh, it, in a lot of ways it is, but uh, some of the models actually we used uh, can be reused uh, for, for Trenkoff imaging. And so just to give a, a background uh, for those that haven't been in our group, uh, what Trenkoff, the Trenkoff effect is, uh, here's uh, Trenkoff in this picture, um, and him and Frank and Tam were, were given the uh, 1958 Nobel Prize in Physics for further discovery interpretation of this effect, which is basically says that as a charged particle travels through a dielectric medium faster than the phase velocity of that medium, it's going to have a coherent light that's generated off of it, similar to like a sonic boom that you would see in a plane when it goes faster than the speed of sound. This is just essentially it's going faster than the speed of light and creates uh, what's commonly uh, known as this um, or observed as this blue glow in a nuclear reactor that's being cooled by water or um, it's used in astronomy for looking at high energy particles entering the atmosphere that have this cascade of light. Um, and they have very sensitive detectors looking at the, the light sources coming in to triangulate where the rays are coming from. And so uh, just some basic simulations of X-ray photons and how they interact with the water tank. So in the, the blue cube here is a water tank. The red lines are X-ray photons traveling down. And as those X-rays travel through the water, um, there's a certain amount of high energy electrons that are scattered off and travel through the water for a certain distance. And so those high energy electrons are the charged particles. Um, as they travel, uh, they will emit, they'll, they'll be the Cherenkov effect uh, happens along, along their path and emit multiple optical photons, which then scatter uh, through, through the, um, the uh, material. And that's what we can detect with sensitive detectors. And so why we want to use this uh, and why this is important is uh, if you remember uh, one of the earlier slides showed the difference between blue and red uh, excitation where you use an external uh, light source. So this is epifluorescence, external light source, um, trying to excite something that might be below the, 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 um, the tissue surface. So blue light is going to be attenuated really after 200 microns, so the thickness of about two hairs. Uh, whereas the Cherenkov effect is related to dose and the maximum dose you're going to have for, for X-ray photons in radiation therapy through between 6 and 18 MV, which is the common uh, energy levels used, is uh, the maximum dose will occur between one to three and a half centimeters into tissue. And so that means that the light's actually being generated centimeters deep into tissue um, and predominantly blue light, but uh, we'll see in a second other wavelengths of light. And if you have a compound that can absorb that blue light and then re-emit longer wavelengths to red light, that red light will be able to travel further through the tissue and be detected at the surface. And so just some quick uh, simulations or um, estimates that I did for um, an early paper on this, uh, looking at the amount of Cherenkov of photons that are generated for different doses of uh, 6MV um, X-rays. Uh, you can see here, this is a one over lambda squared. So it's one over the wavelength squared distribution of, of the light source. And so this is on a log graph. It looks fairly straight, but it's actually um, a pretty um, big dip. And uh, it's predominantly blue and UV. And that's why we see in those pictures, um, it looks blue in water. Um, but if you account for tissue and the things in tissue, the chromophores in tissue that absorb light, like blood and other, um, other factors, a lot of the blue light is absorbed by the tissue before it reaches the surface. So this, this graph here shows for the different wavelengths of light along the x-axis. Um, and the different lines are how many millimeters through the tissue the Cherenkov light has to, to travel. Um, even after one or two millimeters, you really have very little blue light left. Uh, and so really what you're seeing, especially after um, multiple um, millimeters to a centimeter, is mostly red and near infrared light. And so um, just to look at this experimentally, this is a little bit of a, a tangent from the, the later um, work I'm going to be talking about, but it's, it's an important piece of, of, of this um, just to kind of explain what we're trying to do. 
So we have an intensified camera that we use experimentally where basically it um, takes almost near single photon events and amplifies them with an intensifier. And then it uses a standard uh, camera CCD or CMOS detector to detect um, the events. And so this is just a picture of a mouse phantom. So the, the outline here is the mouse. And then we used a thin sheet of x-rays across the, the center of the mouse uh, to estimate um, the signal to noise and, and show the different images. And so we're comparing uh, in the, the white region and then outside of the mouse for the, the different uh, regions. And so uh, you can actually uh, gate the intensifier very quickly to be synchronized with the, the linear accelerator delivering, delivering the dose. And so if you gate it and only collect one pulse of, of that cycle, um, you really don't see much. Even at one, two, four pulses, you aren't seeing a whole lot. And so there isn't really much signal. But as you move, um, uh, accumulate more and more, um, and then um, you can see that there, there's brighter signal. But at these upper ends, you're actually getting a lot of background noise also. And so um, there's a, a trade-off between, between the two here. So you can um, see in these, uh, these lower two plots of signal to noise ratio and signal to background ratio, as you sum basically more frames together or um, wait longer before you uh, read off um, with analog to digital converter, uh, you have higher uh, signal to noise values, but you're also giving more dose uh, to get those. So if we look at a, a constant dose um, uh, in the, the orange circles, so, um, right, so this is what I just said, where if you accumulate more, you're giving higher dose. Um, so really what you wanna look at is when you have a constant dose, um, there's a certain area where the, there's sort of a knee in the, the, um, the signal to noise ratio. And that's, that um, is what we think is the, um, basically it's read noise limited or um, limited by the dark current. Um, so you actually get a very big increase as you, you sum more together in this region. But when you start to add more and more frames together at um, sort of the shot noise limited or where there are lots of photons, um, you're going to have lots more background and summing the frames actually isn't helpful at that point. So you really want to be um, sort of at this, this inflection point here uh, between the two areas. Um, and that's something that I'll come back to a little bit uh, with some of the, the Turing cuff excited luminescence imaging a little bit later. Um, but first, uh, just to get into a little more modeling of, of the Monte Carlo simulations, uh, you can look at uh, uh, photon sources or electron sources in thin sheets, um, because some of what we were trying to do was uh, use thin sheets to reconstruct uh, 3D models of where the, the light is coming from. Um, and with the, the models, the nice thing is that you can actually, uh, in the simulations, you can track uh, the, uh, the, where the events originate and where they, they, um, the final location and time and wavelength of all these, these parameters. And so you can keep track of, of a lot of different things in the simulation. And using that information, I created a little animation here uh, showing. Um, so this is all from the same simulation, just different views. Uh, so this is an ISO view here where in the 3D view, you see the red lines are x-rays going down into a seven layer skin model. And then this XZ is looking down this thin sheet of x-rays. And in the tissue, uh, there are multiple colors that are being generated here. And those are the Cherenka photons and the colors correspond to the wavelength of, of the, the mission. So a lot of blues, but also um, it goes from blue around 400 nanometers out to red at 600, 650. And then beyond 650, I, I changed it to, to gray uh, for um, the near infrared uh, light. And so there are big dots here and then small dotted lines. Uh, if we go the small dotted lines show where the, the trink of photons start and where they finish, where they finally scatter and are absorbed. And one of the interesting things here is there are a lot of colors being generated in the tissue if you look at the cross section of the tissue. But um, this is a top view and these are um, indicating the, the big dots are essentially uh, photons that escape the surface. And most of those are red or gray, which are um, essentially beyond 600 nanometers. And so um, one of the things I did more recently was look at, I expanded the skin model, which was really um, only the first, uh, about first eight millimeters of skin and adipose tissue. So I expanded the adipose, added um, more, here's some more fat, and then muscle below that to see how it would um, continue to affect the shrink off emissions as we get deeper into tissue. And so um, the interesting thing here is that the, the dose increases as you go deeper, 
but um, when you get to muscle, the this is the at different depths um, the amount of the Cherenkov fluence that you would observe, and uh, with muscle, the the fluence really drops off, and a lot of that has to do with the uh, tissue optical properties of the, the the muscle. It absorbs much more, so the muscle is this solid line here, and then the adipose tissue is below that a good amount. So um, that's uh, sort of one indicator. We we commonly think that Cherenkov emissions are correlated to dose, but that's only when the optical properties are all uniform. And so if we zoom in here just to the first uh, centimeter or so of tissue, we can compare uh, Cherenkov uh, fluents, which are um, these dotted lines uh, at the top here, uh, with uh, red or blue light fluents uh, into tissue. And um, uh, one of the things we can use this for is to see how much uh, Cherenkov excited luminescence, what the limits of detection are uh, in this sort of model. So if we say we have a tumor that's one, uh, one centimeter sphere or orb uh, that has uh, certain optical properties that are similar to um, muscle or, or, or adipose tissue, and then we add fluorescence properties to it that are similar to a compound I'll talk about in a minute that absorbs blue and red light and then emits NIR light, um, we can see what the limits of detection are for um, a system like this, where the top row shows when we excite with blue light, um, we really can only see uh, the, the topmost portion down to the first 200 uh, microns in, in tissue. And then uh, with the red light, you can see deeper down to one or two millimeters. But with the, uh, the Cherenkov light, the 6MV, we can, really, we can see all the way down to seven millimeters. And this seems to, um, um, and this is just a plot of the normalized uh, fluorescence detected at the surface for each of these. Um, and so these darker uh, pink lines are blood nets that are in the, the model. So basically uh, high areas of attenuation. And um, uh, one of the nice things about this, it, because it's a model, you can actually look at how much uh, light is being generated in the tumor itself. And the amount of light being generated in the tumor at seven millimeters is fairly similar actually to the amount of light being generated um, at, at some of the higher, um, Values. It's a little bit lower, but it's, it's, it's similar. But a lot of that light, less than 2% of it is actually reaching the surface. So it seems like it's, it's limited by the, the wavelength of the phosphorescence that's coming off of the, the, um, the compound that we're trying to excite. And so the compound um, that I was simulating here is PTG4. It's a compound that we uh, received from Sergei Vinogradov's group at UPenn. And we've been using this in a lot of our studies uh, where the nice thing about it is that it uh, has a long lifetime that we can image um, and it's sensitive to oxygen, which I'll be talking about in a minute. But we've also looked at a few other compounds and we have a paper on this uh, where we looked at iridium, um, an iridium compound um, that's not oxygen sensitive, but could be used potentially for, for um, Trenkov imaging. And we have a europium uh, compound that we've been looked at, some other silicon nanocrystals. And uh, we've done a lot of work recently with tattoo inks that I'm not going to get into here, but um, pretty interesting stuff. And uh, the way we image is to, um, we have a linear accelerator head here that delivers um, high energy x-rays through the sample and those travel through a mirror. And then the mirror is actually used to redirect the Trenkov light towards the camera. And so um, these are pulsed at 360 Hertz. And so we can image during the x-ray pulse um, for the four microseconds that the x-ray is on uh, to get a Cherenkov image. Or we can image after the pulse at different delays using the intensifier to delay the camera um, to uh, um, estimate uh, basically a decay time of the phosphorescent compound that we're, we're looking at. And so the, the like I, I just mentioned, the, the linear accelerator, it runs at 360 hertz and we'll, we'll capture multiple pulses uh, at these different delay settings to, to image what we're looking for. And so uh, using the PTG4, uh, uh, this compound that's oxygen sensitive, uh, we're, we're trying to look at the um, differences in um, oxygen hypoxia seen in tumors. And this is important um, because uh, tumor hypoxia is correlated with a poor prognosis, more aggressive phenotype. And ideally um, from this, this graph here, we see that oxygen, oxygen can diffuse about 100 to 150 microns uh, away from a capillary. So we really want resolution that's uh, about that um, good, if not better. And um, another um, key point here is that um, 
there's not just a uniform value for what the, the tumor oxygenation, the partial pressure of oxygen is, it's actually a distribution. And so a lot of people look at this metric of um, the hypoxic fraction, which is the amount of um, the tumor volume that has uh, um, less than 10 millimeters of mercury of um, oxygen. And so um, one of our earlier papers on this in Nature Biomedical Engineering is uh, demonstrating how, how we can do this, where we scan a thin sheet of x-rays across um, a mouse and we, we collect the Cherenkov light coming, uh, being generated in the mouse. And that, that light is actually exciting two, um, two uh, inclusions here, or two tumors that have PTG4 injected in them at different delays after the, the x-ray pulse. And we can use this information uh, to estimate at the different delays, the intensities in each pixel, and then um, estimate the, uh, the lifetime of the decay using this, um, fitting this equation here. And so using the lifetime, you can then use the Stern-Volmer relation to estimate the PO2 uh, in, in the tumors uh, pixel by pixel. Uh, so one of the caveats here is that um, in some of our previous publications, we needed about four to 12 gray used uh, to estimate PO2. Now, a lot of times when people go in for uh, radiation therapy treatments, they'll get a two gray dose fraction every day for a week or multiple weeks. Uh, so the fact that we needed uh, two gray for each of these images uh, makes it so it's not quite clinically feasible yet. But um, Chu in our group actually um, just uh, published a paper where he brought this, he had the amount of dose he used and still had really um, good signal. And uh, he was actually able to also look at a lot of the biodistribution information for PTG4. Uh, some of the work I'm going to present, present about in a minute here is uh, uh, reducing this even further to see if we can uh, detect multiple, um, come up with multiple maps within a two gray dose. And so um, how we did this were through the custom modifications uh, that Mike Germain put together for us um, in the, the dose optics camera that we used. And so if we look at the pulse, a pulse train of the Linac, uh, showing that we, we uh, image Trenkoff during the pulse, Trenkoff excited luminescences between pulses, we can collect a Trenkoff image and multiple different delays after the pulse and a background to subtract that. And so what we were doing before was uh, imaging one to two gray at one setting, then changing the settings on the camera, imaging for one to two gray, and continuing this process. Uh, so each setting had its own one to two gray. And what we, we did um, with this custom modification, we, we changed the intensifier to gate a little bit differently, where it, it collects a trank off image, and then it can collect actually five different um, settings. Uh, at different delays and durations. And so we can image a Trenkoff image followed by three or four different uh, Trenkoff excited luminescence images and continue down uh, cycling through this multiple times uh, to quickly uh, um, basically come up with a stack with multiple different delays that we can separate out and estimate uh, the lifetime from those images. And so we combine this with a new compound that Sergei Vinogradov's group put together um, and gave us a sample of uh, last year and uh, the nice thing about this new compound, it's really similar. It's a similar core structure to PTG4, but it's more sensitive to light. Um, and it has a quantum yield about three times higher than uh, what we were using with the PTG4. So combining that with the, the, the changes in the timing allow us to have much higher sensitivity to um, PO2. So one of the first things I did with this was to compare PTG4 and the Oxy42P, this new compound in solution. And so there are images here in the, the top row of um, the Oxy42P in solution in PBS. Uh, so, and then also a low oxygen version, which we just added a glucose oxidase catalase, which consumes oxygen in, in the sample. And that makes it, um, you can see in the scale bar here, it's much brighter um, and it has a longer lifetime. And so a few of the things I wanted to look at in this in vitro experiment was, um, methods for calculating the lifetime. So you can do uh, a direct calculation where you actually just look at the ratios of, of values at two different lifetime, uh, two different time points, um, or comparing that to using three time points and doing a curve fitting. And um, the ratio method is about 5,000 times faster computationally, but it also suffers from a lot of noise artifacts and makes it so we have to throw out a lot of the values. Um, so there's a trade-off between uh, how quickly you want the results and, and um, how many 
values you get in the results. And then we also um, decided that this 50 microsecond delay was actually a little too long if we want to image, um, be able to have sensitivity at the atmospheric oxygen at the higher oxygen levels. And so in all the in vivo experiments I'll show in a minute, uh, the maximum uh, delay we used was 25 microseconds and we did another one at 15 in between these two. And so um, this is, there's a lot going on here, uh, but uh, if we look at um, in this uh, basically heat map with the contour lines, as we move across the x-axis, we're increasing uh, the number of frames uh, we're summing together. So we're increasing the dose and decreasing the temporal resolution. And as we move up on the y-axis, we're summing together, we're binning together pixels. And so um, if we just stop this for a second, um, you can see that there's sort of a diagonal line that's the trade-off between uh, temporal resolution. Uh, so you could have a low temporal resolution where you have um, an estimate every four seconds um, at a, a pixel resolution similar to what we were seeing in our previous publications or you could estimate at maybe one to two estimates for PO2 per second at a um, much lower pixel resolution. Um, and so we're here, this is just the standard deviation of uh, the distribution of the PO2 um, um, for these in vitro samples. And so we can combine this, um, this is just an example of the automated workflow for in vivo analysis, where this is going uh, real time. So over 20 seconds at two gray dose, uh, we have nine samples uh, for PO2, and it's actually the, the lifetime that's shown here in these plots. So this is a mouse that's injected with uh, PTG4 and Oxy4-2P, both in Matrogel on uh, this, this um, flank over here. And so Matrogel just um, is a compound that's more, it's liquid at room temperature, but when it, it's at body temperature, it hardens. So it allows us to have like a, a hard ball that we can image and um, image the compound uh, while we give radiation. And then on the other flank, there's a FADU, a head and neck tumor that's injected with Oxy42P. And so we can see these are the same color bars, but there's a much longer lifetime, so lower oxygen levels after we sacrifice the mouse. So this is, a, um, on the left, it's a mouse that's anesthetized, um, and uh, a, a mouse on the right that's uh, after we sacrifice them. So oxygen uh, is depleted. And so if we look at this, um, for Oxy42P, uh, uh, for multiple mice, uh, so in tumors versus in the matrix gel, uh, compared to the injection time and the sacrifice time, uh, we can see a, a few takeaways here are that uh, the tumor is uh, overall, the median uh, PO2 value is a little bit lower for uh, the tumor than the, the matrix gel. And then after sacrifice, we're seeing that it, it goes uh, to about 10 millimeters of mercury or, or fairly low. Um, for the five mice. And if we look at a box plot and a violin plot of the, the two, um, one of the key takeaways here is that the hypoxic fraction, so the amount um, that's below 10 millimeters of mercury, is about double in the tumor than in the matrix gel. And then both of them are, are similar after sacrifice. And so trying to figure out what our, um, our uh, basically the, the minimum dose you need to, to image this, um, I looked at um, these compounds in vivo um, at the different delays, and I, I imaged uh, over a full two gray for each setting to see uh, where uh, the, the best SNR is, or the, at least where um, the SNR is above one, so we can say that's our, our minimum detectable area, or minimum detectable dose. And so as we um, move to later delays, it, it goes, the SNR will go down, and so we can see uh, for PTG4 and matrix gel at the longest delay, we need about 20 centigrade, a little less than 20 centigrade. Whereas Oxy42P in matrix gel, we only need about seven centigrade um, for the, a similar compound. And so Oxy42P is much brighter and we're able to detect it a little bit easier. Um, and um, so this is just kind of showing our limits of detection of what we would need. So to summarize and conclude um, the, the four different aims, uh, at the beginning I talked about um, how parallel Monte Carlo execution can be used to uh, effectively reduce the computation time uh, of uh, simulations. And uh, one of the key benefits of this, it was all scripted and allows for the cloud-based distribution uh, and deployment. So institutions without a high performance computing cluster or can't, that can't afford a, a large server uh, can just 
uh, run the script uh, and then just pay for the server time they use. So uh, for the PDT experiments, it was about $10. Um, and then uh, I showed how these simulations could be used to generate lookup tables uh, for uh, clinical use. And then uh, for the second aim, I looked at how the, we showed how the weather reports can be used as um, uh, uh, a metric for, um, or surrogate for the irradiance measurements. And this was uh, uh, clinically tested by the photobiology unit at Nine Wells Hospital in, in Scotland. And uh, the, so the same modeling techniques can be used for Trankoff imaging uh, and estimating Trankoff fluence. And so from this, we saw at tumor depths um, greater than seven millimeters for the models that we were using that less than 2% of the Trankoff excited luminescence is actually reaching the surface. And um, finally, with the PO2 estimates, we're reducing the overall dose used to estimate PO2 by 10 to 20 times uh, with a similar uh, spatial resolution. And if you, um, there's obviously a trade-off between spatial and temporal resolution. So if you don't care about the spatial resolution as much, you can actually uh, increase the estimates to one to two uh, PO2 estimates per second. So just to uh, conclude with a, a few of the, the publications, presentations, and posters, um, for all this work, there's sort of different categories of PDT, Trinkoff, Excited Luminescence, and then side projects. Uh, and for PDT, uh, one of the most recent uh, articles looked at uh, weather-based uh, dose planning and was actually featured on this month's cover of Photochemistry and Photobiology. Uh, and then for Trinkoff, uh, there's uh, the PO2 work is still actually in preparation. Um, and then uh, a lot of other articles uh, looking at PO2 and other uses of, of Trankoff. And then a few other sort of side projects uh, looking at X-ray PDT, Monte Carlo. Um, I have a paper I'm working on um, submitting right now, some areas of surgical guidance and then some global health work. Um, and then there's some open source code that's available. Uh, so the interactive modeling for PDT is available on CodeOcean. Uh, that's that first link. And then uh, I put together some tools to interface with uh, one of the devices we have in the lab for, for imaging fluorescence. And then all the, the cloud-based Gamos work is up on GitHub. So with that, I'd like to thank my committee, all, all of our collaborators, everyone in the lab, my funding sources at the NIH and NSF, and thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to take questions. All right, I'm gonna also unmute myself. Um, Ethan, can you see if people have questions? Either maybe turn on video and up your hand, or um, I think there's a way to um, actually raise your hand digitally as well. Yeah, yeah, so I think if you try the digital way of raising your hand, it should pop you up in the list. Or... Is it under reactions? Uh, I think it's under participants. Oh, under participants. Okay. Although I don't have it on mine, so I, I don't think I can raise my hand for myself. It's, uh, <clears throat> you have to hit the more button, I think. Oh, and, oh no. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Actually, no, it's not there. Hmm. Tim, participants. Yeah. Click on participants, and it's the leftmost icon at the, in the bottom window. Mine just says yes. <laughs> I think if you're the host, it doesn't, you don't yeah. have that. Oh, ability. if the host, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. All right. So, so do we have any questions for Ethan? Alberto has one. Oh. Okay. Oh, sorry. I think it was, uh, I, it's an applause icon. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I, think, uh, <laughs> I think Tayaba does, actually. Yeah. No, no, I was just trying it out. That's all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay, no questions? All right. I'll ask the question. Okay. Yeah, where I've left, I've broke my, my screen two seconds. <laughs> Hi, Ethan. <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, no bad. Well done, that was a brilliant talk. Uh, can I just ask on your, your daylight PDT for your, your window measurements, you stop your graph at a certain dose. Uh, what happens when you exceed past this dose? Uh, for your uh, 
so after your calculations for when you uh, model the cloud cover, you mm -hmm. have your, uh, don't have to word this now, you have your, uh, your predicted value. So if you set at the window this long, this is a dose that a patient should, re should receive. However, it seems to, the graph seems to stop at a certain, certain dose after a certain time, obviously. What happens if this is extended? Does your model still hold within that estimated range? Or does it deviate? Oh, um, so are you saying, let me just pull up that graph. Um, was it? Maybe in the next, um, in this, this graph where it stops? Yeah, so yeah, this one, yeah. So see how it stops at uh, 200. Uh, yeah, it, it, what happens if you extend that to a higher number? Does your model still hold in its accuracy or does it deviate? Yeah, so I actually, um, I think those were the peak values that we measured. Um, uh, so it should hold, but I haven't actually tested that. So um, because we were doing, I think this was a certain time of year where it didn't get super sunny and we were behind the glass. Um, I think it was in the, the springtime. Um, it would be interesting to test this in uh, the summer and make sure that it does hold after that. Um, yeah, because it is a little untested. We actually have a few clinical trials ongoing with dermatology where we're going to be to measuring that. So hopefully we can update this and make it a little um, more robust. Good. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Um, are there any other questions? I guess, let me see, am I on here? I had yeah. made to, so, so with your smartphone weather app that you're developing with the Quell, I guess. Yeah. Company. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah it's a hard so there were two elements to it and I've got a little confused. So you're, you're going to use your dosimeter that you plug into the iPhone to measure the ambient light. And then you have a lookup table, right? For the weather conditions and, but then you said you're also going to use Alberto's the, the yeah so, you're developing and to, to measure PP9 and how did those two get used together? Yeah, so the the site assessment you're doing the the initial irradiance measurement um, is sort of separate from the app right now, um, where we would probably have to do that with a spectroradiometer just to make sure the spectrum of the light is. Um, so outside of the app, we would just measure um, the spectrum for that specific location and just save oh. that, um, that reading to the, the registry of the, the site location. And then we would use Alberto's fluorescence uh, do dosimeter, the clip-on device, for measuring the patient during treatments. Oh, so you could modify the, the length of time, for example, based on how much pore yeah. pore I mean, ideally, that's what we want to do. We haven't tested that or developed any models around that yet, but the idea would be that you would measure the amount of uh, PP9 that's developed in the skin, and then you could um, use that to, estimate, to modify the dose models and, and how, how long they need to sit, or maybe say they need to incubate a little bit longer uh, mm -hmm. before you do treatment. And so we could customize all the, the treatments uh, to the patient. Yeah, you get your sensitivity boosted up that you could do that, I guess. Thank you. Um, I think uh, uh, Shudong might have had a question. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, yes, I have a question. Like, uh, um, so when you're doing the daylight uh, PDT, um, if you like the weather is not enough, do you have any study can like uh, combine the like a uh, sunlight PDT with some kind of the supplemental like a uh, the light source PDT? Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, right now, some of the studies we're looking at, we're comparing red light PDT with daylight PDT um, and to see, but I don't think any of the studies were actually um, supplementing one or the other, but it, it seems plausible that you could use um, a certain light source. The, the problem with that is that you, if you wanna use the app, you need to know the spectrum of the light source um, and we have measured in the past different light bulbs and LEDs and different sources uh, where we could have that as the part of the database and it could tell you how long to sit under there if we had a way of measuring how um, their, the intensity of the light source. Um, so it's a little bit of a tough problem. 
Obviously, if you had like a red light or a blue light, it'd be a little bit easier to do uh, than a white artificial white light source in, in place of daylight. Um, so does that answer your question, question Shidong? Yes. Yes, so, um, so for the, uh, the second question is that when you're doing the chain cuff and mm -hmm. you show uh, uh, data that uh, if you like uh, use the red light or the near infrared, then you can go to the centimeter, like almost the centimeter, centimeter of the depths. Um, yeah, that was the, the fluence. Let me see if I can. Um, yeah, I mean, the fluence is going down multiple orders of magnitude at, at, at that point. Um, so that's basically the overall fluence, but then you need to use that to excite the, the compound. So really the sensitivity to the, uh, the compound in the tumor really only goes down to two millimeters. Okay, so that you mean that curve, uh, that like a graph is just for the like a, um, sort of chain of like, no, light source. It's not the uh, light that you can pick up from your camera, right? Right, yeah, it's just a model of um, how many photons are reaching the surface. So it's not necessarily what you could detect with the camera. Although we do think we're sensitive to single photon detections, um, but we haven't really had a good way of proving, proving that. Okay, okay, thank you. Hey, Ethan, I, I just wanted to follow up on Ed's question while, while he's still here. Um, yeah. the, uh, so if, if you're doing daylight PDT, um, you know, presumably you're, you're delivering the light fairly early after administration of the drug. So uh, do you expect to be able to see anything from the dosimetry to be able to advise um, yeah. on, on on uh, light delivery time? Yeah, so uh, I believe with Alberto's device, um, after we usually incubate for about half an hour and he's been able to see uh, PP9 with the device after half an hour. Um, so we expect to see a little bit uh, within that half hour incubation period, but some people, um, some groups, I think don't use any incubation period. So then you couldn't use that information to help it, um, uh, sort of advance the, the model and make it uh, a little more sensitive to or personalized to the patient. Right. Although if I could interject, we, we have tried this in the clinic with a 30 minute incubation that you were talking about that does give sensitivity and there's no increase in the pain that the patients experience during the blue light treatment after that. So it's still feasible, I would think. There's some hope there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, then, and just to interject here, Alberto, um, I think we, we're thinking that what we'll probably see in the end is there's going to be a sweet balance between when we say is the incubation period and when we start treatment to be able to have that uh, treatment personalization for the patient so that we can read some increase in the, in the fluorescence that we're observing and to be able to tell what the treatment should be for the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So if there aren't any more questions, then I think we'll end the public portion and just have um, Ethan's committee stay on. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Ethan. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Great presentation. Thanks. Yeah, great job, Ethan. Thanks. All right.